So, uh, welcome to the February edition of the User Experience Dallas uh, Meetup. Thanks for coming. If you're new here, please raise your hand. All right. Woohoo! Yay! You. Next to someone that has their hand up, give them a high five. <laughs> All right. All right. Good, good. Great. All right, so the way we generally start the session. Uh, we like to see if anybody is looking for work or uh, hiring. Actually, is anyone hiring? Adam, go ahead and stand up. Adam Polanski. Hi, Adam Polanski. For those of you who don't know me, I'm with uh, Ball Rocket Studios now. Uh, if you go to our website, Ball Rocket Studios, we've got a lot of positions open in the uh, UX space. Uh, we're also looking for somebody in the usability area. So uh, go ahead with that. And all right, my name is Jimmy Easley. Uh, I work for Etain Group. We're actually the building right over. Um, first time here, so uh, I do have a couple uh, creative positions open uh, in the North Dallas area. So front-end developers, uh, UX, um, a lot of those positions. So check out our website, etaingroup.com. Uh, or come up to me afterwards. I'd love to talk to you guys. Etain Group, E T E T T A I N Group. Okay. Anybody else hiring or no open positions? Awesome. I will tell you of two companies that I know that are hiring. Uh, AT T. They're hiring in downtown Dallas. They have a lot of openings there. Uh, send me an email, and I can get you in contact with the people that can help you out there. And then uh, Capital One in Plano has a lot of jobs that are open too. And uh, I can get you in contact with the right people. Just send me something through me. Okay? All right, so uh, we have a really long presentation tonight. Um, it's only a thousand slides. Uh, yeah. <laughs> It's over 300 slides, but uh, what I want to tell you is a workshop that we're going to do at the South by Southwest. So what you're going to do is get the very fast, very annotated, somewhat abbreviated version of it. Okay? Uh, Janelle is taking a video of this, so you don't have to worry about taking notes. Maybe just sit back and enjoy the chaos that is Pixel Perfect. Why are you going to post it? Yeah, Janelle will post it. I'll, I'll post it on YouTube and post the link to this meetup group so you can like go later and watch it. So, uh, welcome to Pixel Perfect Strategies for Overcoming uh, Perfectionism. So, there's a poem that's over 100 years old called Invictus, and it's about self-mastery and self-control. And the last two lines sum it all up. I'm the master of my fate, I'm the captain of my soul. And what you're going to learn about tonight is that's actually one of the issues that perfectionists have to deal with. I'm going to take you first to Robin Island, June 12, 1964, Robin Island. This has a rich, horrible history. It started out as a leper colony, became a whaling station, then it was a fort, and then during apartheid it held political prisoners. On June 12, 1964, one of the people getting off the boat was Nelson Mandela. A guard told Mandela that he would die on Robben Island. He would never set foot on South Africa again. He was marched into a prison cell. He looks out onto the prison yard. What he sees is shameful acts being created by the guards. These prisoners would actually chop the same rocks over and over, day after day. Some of the prisoners were running around naked. Some of the prisoners were being starved to death. Some were beaten. Some were tortured. Mandela knew that if he was going to survive Robben Island, that he was going to have to look at the guards, because the guards dictated life at Robben Island. And what he noticed was that the guards try to rob you, rob you of your dignity on a daily basis. And within the first 20 minutes, <coughs> Nelson Mandela wrote in his memoirs, I was... Relief. Nobody can 
controls my dignity but me. Nelson Mandela was an idealist. He was not a perfectionist. He was able to survive Robben Island because of that. Nelson Mandela knew he was the master of his faith. He was the captain of his soul. Now, how does this deal with Alright, again, we, we're going through it, fine tuning. <laughs> Alright, so uh, I'm Brian Sullivan, and we're going to use hashtag perfect. Follow me at Big Design, at Brian K. Sullivan. Uh, I'm a research and testing expert. I work at Tonic 3. I speak at a lot of conferences, run Big Design. Happy to see uh, giant conferences here representing tonight. Wave your hand. There it is. Come on. So uh, I also write a lot, and that's the cover of my book, Design Studio Method, out here in a couple of months. This is the conference, uh, Big Design, September 17th through the 19th. Get your tickets now. My co-presenter tonight is Jay Shu. He's the <laughs> many faces of Jay Shu. So Jay also wrote this wonderful book, Brilliance. And in it, there's actually a little bit of information about perfectionism. I would say half the book. So each of the books are 20 bucks. And if you want one, Bennett, stand up. My writing partner over there handles all the money. So, so connect with him, and we'll sign your book at the end if you want. So Jay's a man of many talents. Uh, he does illustrations, motion graphics, animation, <coughs> user experience design. You see him at a lot of conferences also. Uh, this is our second time to South by Southwest. Rocks Digital, Adobe Max, Big Design. He also started his own conference uh, with a bunch of short guys called Industry Giants. Uh, they have wonderful speakers there. How does this all apply to perfectionism? Though? That's the talk. That's us. Let's get back to the talk. I was given a talk at South by Southwest a couple of years ago. I sent out what I thought was a throwaway comment. Perfectionism kills productivity. It got retweeted 5,000 times. So we kind of knew we had lightning in a bottle. And so Jay and I started talking about perfectionism, and we started looking at all the words that we use. Pixel perfect, intuitive, bulletproof, future proof, simple, first rate, you know, first time, out of the box. Everything had to be perfect, perfect, perfect with designers. Then we started talking about people we knew in a nice way. But one of the things that um, we found out is that a lot of the folks that we know, designers, are a little OCD, right? We also start to look at job description. If you look at job descriptions, you have to be perfect in everything. You have to have, you have to be a unicorn. We also have to know this particular tool inside and out. It's not a popular belief. This doesn't solve everything. And so we're bantering back and forth, but we had a really strange thing happen to us. Jay teaches at Collin College and has for the last 15 years. He received this email from a student, okay? says, Dear Mr. Shu, I need your advice. One of the things I've been struggling with really is perfectionism. Uh, my coworkers think I'm slow. I think they're sloppy. I can't hold down a job. I constantly keep getting fired. I try to be creative. I never finish anything because I don't think my designs are finished. I desperately need your advice. What should I do? And so that led to a very serious conversation about we need to really talk about perfectionism and we wanted to share with you some of the stuff that we found today. Okay. These are all the books that we read. Jay had wrote one. Uh, Creativity Inc. is something Jay had told me for a couple of, uh, I guess like a couple of months to read. I finally read it. Uh, Gifts of Imperfection, Daring Greatly, Dignity. Uh, with the exception of Creativity Inc. Uh, and I think Jay's book, all the rest of them are PhDs. All right. but Jay has a PhD in what I call Life, school of hard knocks. So, we're going to teach you about what we learned about perfectionism. It's going to surprise you in what you find out tonight. Anyway, Jim. All right. So, let's talk about the types of perfectionism. All right. Uh, first, let's start off with the definition of perfectionism, right? Uh, belief that religious, moral, social, artistic, or political perfection is obtainable. Really, when we think about perfection, it's the second definition that really is, is what comes to mind. A personal standard or attitude that re, uh, um, demands perfection and rejects anything less. This is really important, especially that rejects anything less. 
All right, uh, psychologist's view of perfectionism is the desire to be faultless, a fear of imperfection, equating errors as personal defects, right? And viewing perfection as the only route to personal acceptance. Now, if you're a perfectionist in this audience, you're probably thinking it's never enough, right? And what impact does that have on you? Well, we found there's really two general types of perfectionists, maladaptive and adaptive, and there's a line. Now, adaptive perfectionists tend to be the healthy version, maladaptive <coughs> tend to be unhealthy. Adaptives can move towards that unhealthy depending on the environment or things going on in their life. Right? Let's talk about adaptive perfectionists. Satisfied with achievements, make from intense ever, effort, tolerate imperfections, harsh criticism, value self-esteem, and, and I'm going to kind of for speed go through, but we can see it's kind of a positive view on life. And they watch their procrastination tendencies. Right? An adaptive perfectionist motto might be, be calm, I'm almost perfect. Alright? Now maladaptive. Let's look at some of the traits of maladaptive. Unobtainable personal performance standards. Extremely self-critical in self-evaluations. Right? They view their environments as competitive. They feel the need to control their environment. And when they lack control, it manifests in some interesting behaviors. Right? They are also, interestingly enough, notorious procrastinators. Right? The maladaptive motto might be, I can't keep calm, I'm a perfectionist. Right? Brian and I uh, have done two talks. I helped uh, Brian with the DaVinci talk, and Brian and I did produce like Picasso. We can consider Picasso an adaptive perfectionist and DaVinci a maladaptive. Da Vinci did 3,000 or 13,000 pages of sketches, right? Two masterpieces, right? Da Vinci only finished 30 pieces, all right? Picasso was extremely prolific. Uh, we know him from these different periods. What's different about Picasso, he completed 147,000 800 pieces of work. Both of these, by the way, if you're interested, are available on SlideShare. Just go to uh, Brian's SlideShare. All right. Out of the top uh, 10 of the top 50 paintings sold at auctions, 10 of them were Picasso's. Right. And interestingly enough, most of them were from his blue period, which was his most unpopular originally, but now it's the most valuable. Right? Both types can do great work. Right? Both types can do great work. However, what we just saw is which one is more pro prolific? It's the adaptive. Right? Maladaptive struggle with. I can't keep calm. I'm a perfectionist. Alright? Remember the student who shut down. Da Vinci did at the end, and he even said. His last words were essentially, I have wasted my life. <clears throat> this is Leonardo da Vinci on his deathbed, essentially said, I have wasted my hour. All right? All right, so let's compare and contrast a little bit. Adaptive versus maladaptive. Adaptive, their journey is in a regular spiral. Right? Things happen, things change, they kind of move this way, they kind of move that way. For maladaptive, life is a straight line. Now that's interesting. Is life really a straight line? But to them, maladaptives, it should be. Right? Adaptives find benefits. Yes, awesome. This is great. Maladaptives? Yeah, that's all great, but here's where you messed up. Right? Adaptives. Failure is seen as feedback. For maladaptives, feedback is failure. If, if you have anything to say about my piece, I have failed. Adaptives enjoy the destination and the journey. For 
maladaptives, it's just the destination. <coughs> right? Adaptives, they have complex thinking. Maladaptives, it's all or nothing. Right? Adaptives, come on in! I'm open! Let's talk! Maladaptives, no, 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 no. I'm right, you're wrong. <laughs> Adaptives are forgiving. You're you messed up. You're human. Everybody messes up. You suck! And because of you, the company is going to lose money! Right? In the ringing any bells, right? Um, Adaptive imperfections are gifts. Our imperfections are what make us unique and bring variety. To maladaptives, they're curses and things to be fixed. Right? Maladaptives, flexible and adaptable. Ah, oh, A didn't work. Let's try B. A didn't work. Let's try C. Okay, we got plan B. Maladaptives, incredibly rigid, and I love it when a plan comes together, especially mine. Right? Attitude is the difference between an ordeal and an adventure. Great, we're going to play a little game called Pixel Perfect. It's the name of the presentation. So, 50 points for this. See if you can figure it out. Raise your hand if you got it. Awesome. 25 for this one. Anyone got it? Newscasters. Oh, okay, more specific. Boom, boom, it is Anchorman. All right. Don't act like you're not impressed. <laughs> right. We picked this particular film because they're shameless in how they act. Absolutely shameless, getting a laugh. Right? We want to differentiate between embarrassment, humiliation, guilt, and shame. They are not the same thing. However, we tend to use those in our own vocabulary as if they were the same thing. And they are not. And this really cuts to the heart of perfectionism. All right. Let's learn a little bit about embarrassment. Embarrassment is something that's funny that's happened to you. It's an accident. It's usually very short. It might be something like your zipper is undone. It could be that you forgot to attach an email, right? It could be that you put the main call to action buttons below the fold. That's an embarrassing thing. That can happen. We can fix these things, right? Your inner voice might say, a bad thing has happened here. Uh, it's going to be over soon. It happens to everyone. It's fleeting. Humiliation. That's something that somebody else does to you. It's the act of mortifying you to cause painful loss of pride, self-respect, or dignity. In Puritan times, you'd be put into the pillory or the stockades uh, in the public. It was definitely public humiliation. Dunces and hazing uh, would be examples. For us, believe it or not, the usability test can be the most humiliating thing for the participant or for the designer. That's why, as a usability expert, there is a lot of things, uh, procedures that are put in place uh, to not embarrass or humiliate the participant or the design team, right? So, for example, we're testing the product, we're not testing you. That is to diffuse humiliation, right? So your inner voice with uh, humiliation, know the nuance. I, I may deserve to be treated badly here. Uh, these folks are doing it, I'm different, maybe there's something wrong with me. Guilt. That's when, you, yes, you've done something wrong. You've been texting while driving. You've been smoking in a place where you shouldn't smoke. Uh, you've committed a wrongful act, right? As designers, we have these things called dark patterns. Uh, second best first option, the best offer is for $99. Really? Maybe we over-designed something. <coughs> Maybe we designed the thing on the left, but our customer wants the thing on the right. Right? We feel guilty for that. Know the nuance. With guilt, I've done something bad. I probably am going to get caught. I maybe need to pay for the action, but I can correct it. Actually, guilt is a positive thing because it's correctable. The action is removed from the individual. 
shame. It's an emotion where you see yourself as defective, unacceptable, or fundamentally damaged. Remember the earlier definition that Jay gave you about perfectionism. There's a lofty standards. It's a personal defect if I don't go up to it. Shame is most often felt by victims of trauma. So the people that survived 9-11 or the Holocaust. Holocaust survivors used to call it uh, survivor's guilt. No, it's survivor's shame. Only the pious Jews died in the concentration camps in World War II is what they used to say. Well, perfectionists also feel shame. They feel a great amount of shame. They don't measure up. Their designs are not pixel perfect. There's something wrong. You might say that for perfectionists that are designers, they put the hell in Helvetica. <laughs> <laughs> Critiques feel like character attacks, right? There's something wrong with the design, therefore there's something wrong with me. So know the nuance with shame. I'm a bad person, there's something wrong with me. This thing, whatever it is, proves it. Here they are side by side, embarrassment, a bad thing happened, humiliation, I might have deserved it, guilt, yeah, I did a bad thing, shame, I'm a bad person, okay? Now, perfectionism cuts straight to shame. Dr. Brene Brown is a person that's actually researched shame a lot. Uh, she's from the University of Houston. Where we struggle with perfectionism, we struggle with shame. And really what it amounts to is, are you going to be resistant to shame, and that's what maladaptives do, or are you going to be resilient to shame? That's what adaptives do. They fight through it. The primary purpose of this particular talk is to show you the importance of this the perfectionism is being shame-based and to give you coping strategies, all right? Jay's going to give you uh, a little example here about what it could look like on your team. Right. So let's talk about the heart of perfection, right? Uh, we've already discussed that perfectionists at their center are, have a sense of shame, right? And they carry it with them in their heart. Around that shame is fear, right? And if you're honest enough with yourself, you recognize that you are reacting and behaving out of fear. Okay? This fear then creates barriers. Right? So here we see two perfectionists. Uh, imagine these two perfectionists working with each other. Right? Here's a perfectionist and a non-perfectionist. What impact is this perfectionist going to have on the non-perfectionist? Let's take a look at a team where we've got five perfectionists that are inside this bigger team. What's scary is not all the barriers are the same. These barriers can be different. Each perfectionist can exhibit different barriers, and what happens when you have multiple perfectionists with different barriers in a team? They can essentially affect, infect the rest of the team. And it's, you're not all dealing with the same thing, right? But these perfectionists exactly suit these emotions and are absorbed by the other people on the team. Right? It's not about resistance. It's about resilience. So, again, we have the heart of shame, surrounded by fear, which creates barriers. Okay, here are some of the shame-based barriers of perfection that we're going to be talking about. Okay, foreboding joy, procrastination, sarcasm, numbing, biking or victim, floodlight, smash and grab, and zigzagging. Right? Energy is contagious, both positive and negative alike. Cool, pixel perfect, number two, 50 points. Anyone have a guess? Awesome, we'll pixelate it a little less. How about now? First summer. Huh? First summer. Oh, first. Last summer. Says one of you will betray me. 
All right, so let's go ahead and talk about foreboding joy now. I'm going to bring you back to Ellis Island at the turn of the, from the 18th to the, or the 19th to the 20th century. Uh, this is really just about a quarter of a mile long, yet during that time, 20 million immigrants came through here. Okay? 20 million, big number, right? Guess what? That is 1 million more than the state of Florida today. Massive amount of number. Let me give you a little story about maybe what it was like for them. They go into Ellis Island. They're fleeing war and famine, uh, plagues, religious persecution. You name it, they're fleeing. They go to Ellis Island. They get a health inspection. They have to show their cards. Everything passes. They go through. They're still filled with joy. They're in America. They've made it. They hit the streets. They start finding other people that they know. They go to tenements. Believe it or not, they love the tenements. The tenements usually were better than the place that they left. They formed communities. They found families. They found loved ones. They had jobs, sweatshop type jobs, and some of them loved it. They made more money than they were making wherever they came from. Right? They're tired. They slept. They dream. They're happy. They're dreaming about the future. It's a grateful time. And then, you know, in these tenement walls, real thin, paper thin, the guy upstairs in the middle of the night to drop a shoe. This is where we get the term, the other shoe is about to drop. Okay? That's what foreboding joy is. The other shoe is about to drop. Foreboding joy is the fear of actually enjoying the moment. A joyful, perfect moment, perfectionists don't allow themselves to have. Now, imagine the finding no joy in a journey. Jay had mentioned that before. They only like the destination. And I will tell you, they only like the destination sometimes. They don't all the time. Imagine no joy in the journey and only sometimes having joy in the destination. So, you don't enjoy your first kiss, the launch of a successful product, you don't really fully enjoy a marriage, you don't really fully enjoy your first job. Brene Brown says the most terrifying emotion for perfectionists is joy. It can be the most terrifying emotion for all of us because it can be taken away. So imagine, these are people that like perfectionism. Imagine a perfect moment in life. Pixelated. They don't fully enjoy, they don't fully enjoy the fullness of life. They pixelate it. That's foreboding joy, they're numb. Any of these things they despise. They despise vulnerability. Joy makes them vulnerable. Okay? So what can happen is this. <clears throat> a perfectionist might have this barrier. Foreboding joy. So what they do is they dress rehearse tragedy. Alright? So here's what happens. You got a new product that's about to go out the door. When it goes out the door, guess what? Your customers line up. They love it. They're asking for more. You have more customers than you've ever had in the world. The product team is stoked. They've done a great job. They deliver early. They deliver it on time. The customers love it. Sales are up. For the perfectionist with foreboding joy, oh my God, the other shoe is about to drop. It's too good to be true. Something must be wrong. What they will do is use the five W's and the H to try to find out what's wrong. How can this be wrong? How can this be right? What's about to go wrong? Who's going to make a mistake? Why is this going to happen? Where is the fault? Right? Where's the fault? When is it going to happen? Any minor news that might sound negative becomes of a, I told you so, I got gotcha, you, by the person that's a perfectionist. Again, there's no joy in the journey. The other shoe is about to drop. So, what's the antidote to the barrier of foreboding joy? Anyone want to give a guess? Alcohol. <laughs> we'll get to that. That's later. It's actually simple, yet for a perfectionist, 
probably the hardest thing that they're going to have to do. And it is gratitude. <coughs> gratitude. Enjoy the journey. Be thankful for the challenge. Gratitude unlocks the fullness of life. It turns us into having enough. It turns a house into a home, a stranger into a friend. Gratitude is the best attitude. Enjoy the new product. Your, your friends and partners and uh, product team are happy. The sales are up. You took the challenge. Express gratitude at the end of a design sprint. That puts money into an emotional bank account. It builds a stronger relationship. When you're critiquing something, let's have a gratitude sandwich. Let's do a one-two-one, -one, a positive comment, two critical, and one positive. Now, in Ed Catmull's wonderful book, uh, he said that critique should be additive, not competitive. Right? In the early days of Pixar, imagine the foreboding joy of all of the writers about to get critiqued by John Lasseter of Toy Story, Andrew Stanton of Finding Nemo, Brad Bird of The Incredibles. Wouldn't you be stoked to get a critique from them? And wouldn't you be terrified also? What they did at Pixar, and they still do it, meetings are done with honesty and candor. All right, now, have you guys seen the movie Wally? -E? Right? Wally. -E. Here's the original ending. Wally saves Eve from a trash compactor. That's the original ending. They go in for the critique, and uh, Brad Bird says, you know, this is horrible ending. It's horrible. You know why? Because everybody knew Wally loved Eve from the moment he saw her. You're denying the audience what they really want. They want Eve to go all in for Wally, give up all of her programming, and jump. So, the updated, heartfelt ending. Wally actually saves everybody on the ship, but he's damaged, right? Eve presses the hyperdrive back to Earth because she knows that the spare parts are back on Earth. She frantically saves Wally. When Wally restarts, he goes back to his original programming, doesn't even recognize him, and Eve is sad. Does a little kiss to Wally, and oh my God, he perks up, and it's happily ever after. It's a perfect moment, right? What the writer said was he was so glad to get that critique because it made the movie so much better. It was an additive. It wasn't anything about him as a person. It was about the story. So the barrier of perfection. So I don't know why. Uh, Brian wanted me to talk about this section. Right, Bennett? Right. <clears throat> <laughs> Bennett, how long did it take us to do our book? Four years. Four years to, to, to do our book. Right, so let's jump to Zealand Island. It's a small island in Denmark. Uh, Shakespeare used it as a setting for Hamlet. Right? Uh, Elsinore Castle. Uh, Prince Hamlet suspects his uncle killed his father. But he delays seeking the truth. Right? Uh, and when he sees the ghost of his dead father, in Act 1, he says, uh, Father tells him to seek revenge for his murder. And so what does Hamlet do? He delays. Act 2, scene 2, Hamlet has a chance to kill Claudius. Perfect opportunity. He delays. Act 3, scene 1, Hamlet talks to a dead friend, Doric. You know, to be or not to be, what's the deal? He delays. Right? Act 3, scene 3. Hamlet performs a play within a play. And again, he delays trying to publicly humiliate his uncle. Hamlet still has bloody thoughts. Uh, Act 4, he doesn't understand the soldiers who fight on foreign lands. Uh, when the soldiers leave, Hamlet uh, says how his own thoughts are bloody. And what does he do? He delays. So finally, the last scene of Hamlet is a total bloodbath, where everybody dies, right? Shakespeare said there's something rotten in Denmark. It's called procrastination, right? And his delay leads to a way to violence. So we see that the purpose of procrastination is to protect us, all right? Uh, from failure, success, or change, we're terrified, and it fulfills that purpose when we lose all hope and stop trying, it is fear-based. 
One of the reasons I was a, it took so long for me to get my book out was because I was afraid of what people would think about my pictures, <laughs> my illustrations, and my writing. It's my first book. If I put it out there and I wanted to do this book for my students, I was afraid of what people might say because I had done these decent things in the world and I was like people going, oh, really? That's, that's what you did, right? That's kind of what I'm thinking. So, see if you recognize yourself in these procrastination techniques. And if you find a reason to finally do laundry, right? Right? How about the panicker? Oh my god, oh my god, oh my god! Right? The list maker. Okay, before I do anything, let's make a list. Right? Ah, oh, I am tired. You know what? I'm going to do this when I wake up. Sign tracker. You know what I really need to do? But let's do next month. Right? So, so, you know what? As soon as I get off Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, right, Tumblr, then I'll do it. And there's more, right? Before I start, I need to do some research, right? Students in my class, like Jay said, research, 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 right? You know what I need is a snack. And I don't need a snack, but um, there's the gamers, right? Uh, what was my high score, right? The watcher, okay. So, House of Cards, as soon as I finish the season, <laughs> then I'll get started. Right? The delegator, right? Okay, let's put this and this and this. And, you know, I was going to start 30 minutes ago, but now it's getting late. <coughs> you know, I'll do it tomorrow. And then tomorrow. And then tomorrow. They have a name for all of the above. Yeah. <laughs> 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 right? So it becomes what I call a thought spiral. Right? We we force ourselves into this thought spiral. Normally the only thing for me that breaks me out is what? What's the only thing that forces you out of a thought spiral? Deadline. The deadline. Is the absolute deadline. That's why our book took four years because we didn't put the deadline on. Right. So, how do we deal with this? Well, effective time management, right? <laughs> we can also proudly show early design concepts, steampunk style. I would recommend you show up to work like this. They'll know they made the right hiring decision. <laughs> right? For those of you in agile development, this should look familiar, right? Say to do, to what you're doing, to done. Keep track of your progress, right? Test early, test often. As us usability and UX professionals, we should know that well, right? Establish a daily routine, right? And as Brian likes to say, get a routine within a routine. One of the reasons everybody marvels at Brian's productivity is the fact that he figures out a way to get stuff done when he's doing stuff. Right? Targets. Set realistic targets. Use positive self-talk. Interesting factoid. Neuroscientists tell us we have 65,000 thoughts per day, approximately. 65% of them are negative, right? That's roughly 42,000 negative thoughts a day, right? Don't fantasize about the desired results, do them, right? Imagination, even though as creatives, imagination can sometimes be the enemy of motivation. Right? Plan for obstacles. Right? Reward your progress. Right? Set up a reward system. When you do something right, reward yourself. Sometimes 
You also need to say, no house of cards, I didn't do my project. Right? Break large tasks into smaller units. I always tell my students how to eat an elephant. How do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. Right. Putting it off or getting it done. Putting it off does not make it go away. Getting it done, done does. And how many of you are fellow procrastinators like myself that you, how many times have you said, this wasn't that bad, I should have done it last week? Right? 50 points. <clears throat> 50 points. Not good. <laughs> <laughs> 25. 
they don't say what they mean. As a designer, do you want people to say what they mean? Or do you want them to use sarcasm and not say what they mean? Right? So the solution is to create really almost a sarcasm freeze on, but we would say limit sarcasm. Uh, Jay and I like to say sarcasm is like a spice, right? Too much and the dish is overwhelmed. Just enough, it's okay, it's kind of fun. It spices it up. A steady serving, I'm going to cough, gag, and throw up. Can't have it. The dish is ruined. So when you think about it, sarcasm is also a form of bullying. And perfectionists use it to disguise really a type of hostility. And psychologists see this really as bullying. And when you think about bullies, they're angry, they're insecure, they're frustrated. Perfectionists are too. Again, I talked about candor, uh, using candor, and not honesty. There's a whole chapter in this book, Creativity Inc., where Ed Catmull, the CEO of Pixar, specifically says, the hallmark of a healthy creative culture is that people feel free to express ideas and opinions and criticism. Does that say sarcasm anywhere in it? It's about being frank and candid with someone, right? Lack of candor. And I would put in parentheses sarcasm, leads to dysfunctional environments. Your five perfectionists being very sarcastic, awful. So the antidote to sarcasm is going to be respect. Don't gossip, appreciate diverse opinions, be a bridge builder, okay, not a bridge burner. Uh, create a culture directed at competitors, not at each other. Uh, try not to acknowledge sarcastic remarks. Uh, promote ownership. We talk about empathy, how about living it, right? If sarcasm is bullying, stop bullying. Start with empathy. We talk about empathy maps, but do we use them? Remember the other shoe that's about to drop? Here it is, right? If you want to walk a mile in my shoes, see what I see, hear what I hear, feel what I feel, maybe you'll understand what I do. Until then, don't judge me. We've heard that, right? I once told a designer, hey man, I want you to walk a mile in my shoes. But before you did do that, I want you to take your shoes off and now put mine on. What she said to me was, no, your feet are too big and they smell. So, I said to her, this is why you fail. Brian doesn't pull punch. No. You want to pull, you want to pull punch? Here's a camera. All right. What I should have done is ask for an explanation, right, and been respectful. I wasn't. I actually humiliated the person. It actually took that person three weeks to recover from that, right? <coughs> All I said was one sentence. That's why you fail. Examine your sarcasm triggers if you're being sarcastic, right? Some people are only that way in certain situations. Maybe when the, you know, the deadline is really close or something is really amped up, right? Maybe that's when we're doing sarcasm. Maybe it's just when we don't feel good. Maybe it's the first time in the morning. But you know what? Sarcasm fails. If your statement is true, meaningful, and necessary, there's no way it can be sarcastic. <coughs> And so when you're starting to do critiques with people, tell them you want them to be true, meaningful, and necessary. Make that a no sarcasm zone. You'll actually get a lot more out of them. Remember, I humiliated that perfectionist designer. That was the wrong thing to do. Remember, that's about disconnecting sarcasm. I humiliated her and it took her three weeks. It's very tempting. Her words are right there. Right? Humiliation is closely tied to shame. That's a severe issue for that perfectionist. I did apologize to that person once I realized what had happened. Be respectful. Ask for clarification instead. Really easy to do humiliation. Now, one of the things that Jay does that I really appreciate is that he diffuses sarcasm by agreeing. Right? So I'll say something like, you know, Jay, snails move faster than you. And his response is, you know they do, they're fast little buggers, right? But the other way to diffuse sarcasm 
is to announce it. Hey, I'm going to say something funny, a little sarcastic. Snails move faster than me. I'm just joking, by the way. Right? And it's, it's diffused. Right? It's not nearly as biting. And it's okay to do that when you're dealing with your friends. Okay? But sarcasm is a very serious issue with perfectionists. All right. Next picture. 50 points. Anyone got it? Nope. How about this one? 25, come on. Oh, spring. Oh, Boom, Josh got it. Yes. It is scream. Right? And this is the barrier of numbing. All right, so let's, uh, you know, Brian wanted to go around the world, so we're going to go to another island, right? We're visiting many lands, right? And Odysseus, uh, probably the only hero that traveled more uh, that was, than Hercules was Odysseus, right? And so we go to the island of Calypso, right? Homer's Odyssey, Calypso keeps Odysseus prisoner for seven years. Uh, in the case of Calypso, Calypso sings, Odysseus forgets about his beloved wife, Penelope. I would never do that. Rachel. So uh, Hermes tells Calypso to release him. Uh, Odysseus is enamored by Calypso. He is numb to everything else. Right? Calypso, uh, or, yeah, Calypso sets him free. Uh, she fell in love with Odysseus, but eventually she frees our hero. And <laughs> again, I think this is one of the reasons why you want to be that. Yeah, it's appropriate. He did typecasting. Yeah, you should, yeah, yeah, he did. Um, I tend to be crazy busy, right, all the time. And we're a culture of people. We're brought into the idea that stay busy, uh, the, the truth won't catch up to us. And it's an incredible numbing strategy, right? Um, we numb ourselves in debt, all right? Credit cards, mortgage, student loans. Uh, we numb ourselves with food, uh, right? 66% of adults are overweight or obese. 35% uh, of children deal with obesity. You know, and we go through these stats, find, you know, uh, obesity is hit. So we numb ourselves, right? Comfort food, right? We've had a hard day at work. Gosh, that hobby dos looks good, right? Uh, we drink, right? Here you are, right? You know, you promised, right? So check this fact out, right? 2014, Americans recycled enough aluminum cans to rebuild the entire fleet of the U.S. commercial aircrafts twice. Twice! That's only the cans they recycle! That's a lot of cans! Right? Uh, we know ourselves in other ways. How many of you like coffee? Right? right? I draw about it. Uh, there's volume, right? Uh, uh, shopping therapy, right? And uh, of course, wine, right? Other beverages. Uh, wine numbing actually hurts you. Right, this last line, when you numb the dark, you numb the light. Right, I think that summarizes the paragraph before it. When you numb one part of your life, you numb the other parts of your life. We don't like to admit it, but that's what happens. Right, this numbing is not addiction. It's not about resistance, it's about resilience. All right, so how do you deal with this? You draw a line in the sand, right? Each person is different, right? Identifying numbing behaviors and set boundaries, right? In my family, I have alcoholism on both sides of my family, right? When I go out, the most you will typically ever see me do, maybe at Big D, I sometimes have maybe three drinks in a night. But I typically do two. And I almost always do it with food. That's my limit. If you've got genetics on both sides of your family saying this could be a problem, you need to set the mark, right? And I'm a big guy. Man. The TABC doesn't even go to my number. Right? Right? Use positive coping strategies. Right? Walking. I've been walking for 17 days straight, for those of you that keep me up with me on Facebook. 
right? Plan for breaks. You plan for breaks. Uh, Rachel, we have gone on vacation, right? It's been a couple years. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> we try to manage anxiety, right? Don't numb it, right? Asking for help does not equal weakness. Now, what's interesting, Brian and I have been talking about Compliance Inc. Unfortunately, there are many corporate cultures when you ask for help, it is perceived as weakness and incompetence. <clears throat> and people think that they make bad hiring decisions when you ask for help. So what do people do? Isolate themselves. They isolate themselves and they guess. And they don't tell anybody they're not working off of, they're just guessing. Right? That can lead to problems. 50 points. 50 points. Huh? No? No? Okay, 25. 10. Dragon, horse, Oh, good. Who's this? Who are they fighting? Loki. Victim or Viking mentality. We are going to take a trip to Themyscira or Paradise Island now. And DC Comics, that is the home of Wonder Woman. She's a warrior, a hero, a strategist, an ambassador, and a spy. She's also in Amazon. And in mythology, Hercules and Theseus would have several encounters with the Amazons. Every single time they talked to the Amazons, the Amazons marched off to war. With perfectionists that use the barrier of uh, Viking or victim, they see things, you're, either you are a victim in life, a sucker, a loser, who's always being taken advantage of, right? Or you're a Viking, someone who sees a threat and eliminates it, right? It goes back to that either or thinking. Now, funny thing is, the per perfectionist will either see themselves as a victim or a Viking, and the people that exhibit that behavior, that barrier, in one meeting they're a Viking, and in the next they're a victim. What is it, buddy? Right? Perfectionists don't like to show vulnerability, so they adapt a persona. Here's their Viking persona, right? Exert power, stay in control, kick ass. Here are my weapons that I use in a corporate environment. Email, deadline, schedule, gossip, departmental policies, assignments, delegation. <coughs> When they're victims, here's their characteristics. They use whining, excuses, rationalization, justification, blame, finger pointing, no instructions, any deflection strategy that you can think of. They think of themselves as always losing and never winning. Now, what they're doing is they're using vulnerability as a weapon. Using vulnerability as a weapon is not the same thing as being vulnerable. In fact, it's just the opposite. Now, Brene Brown says, when we lead, teach, or preach from the gospel of Viking or victim, <coughs> win or lose, we crush faith, innovation, creativity, and adaptability to change. These people need therapy. What's the solution besides therapy? This is the hard one. Forgiveness. Forgiveness. Relationship. Yeah. So relationship building, you got to cultivate trust and commitment, right? If they're in Viking mode, you're certainly no victim. You're certainly not their, vil uh, their villain, their prey. If they're in victim mode, you're certainly not the villain that's killing them, right? you got to have an emotional bank account with people, everyone, in fact. Now think about it. When you have an emotional bank account, you have deposits and withdrawals. You start at zero. And it's in your daily interactions with people, right? Is it net positive or net negative in your interaction with that person? Now, sometimes the bank's full. It's rare, but it can be. Sometimes your bank is injured. Sometimes it's empty. 
Sometimes it's broken. Sometimes you repair it, but it's never really the same. Most of the time, however, it grows and shrinks, depending upon your daily interactions with someone. But here's the deal. That emotional bank account, you don't have just one. You have it with everybody in your life, and it's at a different stage. Right? One is empty, one's full, one's broken. One's in need of repair. You have, according to a Nobel Prize winner, 20,000 daily interactions with people, right? So you have a finite number, but you have 20,000 daily interactions. Here's the golden ratio of those 20,000. If you have a 5 to 1 ratio, 5 positive interactions with someone and only one negative one, you will have a healthy relationship with someone. Now, there is an upper number. If you have more than 13 with someone, you actually have an unhealthy relationship. That's too much positivity. You don't live in reality. <laughs> now, with, one of the ways that you can make a deposit is you can listen with empathy. Stephen Covey once said, most people don't listen with the intent to understand. They listen with the intent to reply. Has anybody done that? Okay, if you have, you're not making an emotional deposit. You're making a withdrawal, actually, especially when you make that comment, withdrawal. Make a double withdrawal as soon as you say something. How about keeping commitments? That's a great way to make a deposit, show up to work on time, meet your deadlines, attend meetings, take notes, do what you say, fulfill your obligations. Chain, 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 chain. Those are ways that you can really increase uh, the emotional deposit. How about fighting with respect, candor? We mentioned that before. That's true collaboration. You're going to have arguments and disagreements, right? I actually had an interesting thing with Mark the other day. Mark said, Brian, we're going to disagree on something. At one point, I go, yeah, Mark, and it's going to be beautiful. <laughs> because we have had so many deposits into the emotional bank account, when we make a withdrawal, it doesn't hurt. All right? Just make it respectful, Mark, please. Remember the little things count. Uh, remembering somebody's birthday, getting someone coffee, a smile, a nod, anything is an emotional deposit. When you make a withdrawal, apologize. Right? Do it immediately. You want to try to keep your account in the positive, right? Because you have worked hard to get it into the positive, right? When you would make a withdrawal, I'm sorry. Not going to happen again when you make it up to you. When you start making deposits right back into the account. Now, it's not just with people, right? It's also with people's ideas, right? With story building. Ed Catmull talks about uh, the first four form of any of the Pixar films that you've seen, he calls them ugly babies. They need nurturing. They need time and patience in order to grow. Pixar usually takes two to three years for all these ugly babies to become a movie. Right? How many of you guys initially reject an idea? Right? So you're not investing in it at all. Right? You're not considering the value and benefit. Right? He has a chapter called The Hungry Beast and the Ugly Baby. Uh, after Toy Story 2, the Pixar team was exhausted. It took them nearly five years to do Monsters, Inc. They weren't procrastinating. They were tired, right? They wanted to feed the beast and make Toy Story 3. But the creatives stuck to their guns and said, look, no, we need to do a different movie. And they did. But you got to balance in business those ideas that are you know, really good with the new ones. And again, you've got to balance the hungry beast and the ugly baby. Uh, I still recommend doing design studios because you have a lot of US ugly babies early. It's a nice mechanism for us. And it's a good way to kind of manage what I would call victim and Viking mentality because it's such a collaborative effort. Okay? All right, next topic. This is an easy one 50 points. Come on, Josh. Ben, what? 
Not a girl. Nope. 25 points. Madman. Oh, it's the dude the apple. It's the apple guy, right. It's the apple guy. All right, this is actually the son of man. Everything is kind of visible and invisible. It, you know, conceals and reveals, right? We're going to talk about the barrier and now a smashing grab. All right. Typecasting again. Yeah, thanks, Steve. <laughs> that a, uh, see how that flowed off? That, uh, yeah. Yeah. Alright, we're now back to Easter Island. Right? Remember this? How many of you were kids are like, oh my gosh, how'd they do these statues? Right? Everybody remember that? Aliens. So, right, aliens, right? <laughs> so, they actually solved this a few years ago, and what they figured out is, uh, you know, how were the statues created? Where'd all the people go? Right? So this is a recreation of what happened. The statues were pushed up by people, and the local inhabitants used stone, wood, and were forced to actually push these statues up. But in doing so, they cut down all the forest. And so because they cut down all the forest, there were originally 10,000 people. When Captain Cook came, there was 100 people left because they mismanaged their resources, right, but they got big statues. Right? <laughs> so, so smash and grab is actually a manipulation tool, right? The smash and grab occurs when someone smashes through people's social boundaries with intimate information, grabs what they need, right? And then uses it later, right? In social media, it's increasingly difficult to determine what's a real attempt to connect, right? And what's a performance? Okay, uh, do you guys remember this? He kind of escalated his importance, right? Why? He was already a big dude, right? But he felt the need to increase his persona. Gossiping is smashing rap, right? Gaining negative attention toward yourself and the rivals, starting rumors, right? Seven types of social sharing. We have the altruists, selectives, passionates, connectors, trend spotters, uh, provocateurs, careerists, right? 90% of social media is about sharing relevant information with your connections. However, about 10% is a form of smash and grab, which is about showing off or getting attention. Okay, when smash and grab perfectionists Use vulnerability to connect with people is a way to fast forward intimacy. Right? Remember this drawing, right? The antidote is to understand the attention. What is at the heart? Shame. What's surrounding the heart? Fear. This is why you're getting this barrier. Protect yourself and others. Understand the reason you might be hearing it. Brian talked about walking in other people's shoes. If you stop just reacting to people and trying to understand why they are behaving this way, it becomes a less of a reactive instinct for you. Does that make sense? You understand where they're coming from and why they're acting that way, so you don't take it personally. Right? I used to work in a mental health hospital after I got my psychology degree. Trust me. I didn't take anything in schizophrenic said personal. <laughs> right? Like huh? That's like most of the people I've worked with. Yeah, well, there you go. They were one cent. Sorry, I was a little made. I don't know. <laughs> Tell your story to people who aren't it, right? If you do not want to share information with people, uh, you haven't earned it. They'll misunderstand you. Uh, don't share your wounds publicly. See this a lot on Facebook, actually. Right? Right? Cooling off periods before you share things. Benjamin, when you're emotional, how does your brain work? That's right, it doesn't work very well, does it? No, do you make good decisions or bad decisions? Bad decisions, that's right. I try to do that. Have I ever told you it's dumb? No. Okay, all right. Where'd you, I don't like, where do you get that from? All right, a simple uh, checklist, right? Take a look at these. I'm generally asking people for what I need. 
Since design is collaborative, it's easy to make mistakes and need for intimacy. For some reason, artists and designers crave intimacy and intention. Right? If the words don't add up, it's usually because the truth wasn't included in the equation. So on a smash and grab, I'll say one last thing. You just got out of a heated meeting. You go to your perfectionist friend, and you go, oh my god, and you're blowing off some steam. As you blow off the steam, they can take that and use that against you. That's the worst type of a smash and grab. And God knows how <coughs> that happens. All right. Any idea what this picture is? No. Checkerboard. Awesome. No. <laughs> How about now? Minecraft. That's good. That's good. Not Minecraft. How about now? 25 points? Huh? No, it's not good. 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 No. 10 points. Wow. Yeah, I'll go with Alien. Wait, keep it, keep it on this one. Should we give them a way, give away part of this? All right, everybody squint. <laughs> now, go back to the other one to show them, and now squint. No, it doesn't work. All right. <laughs> All right, so this is called relativity, and gravity doesn't apply in this particular universe, right? All right. The stairs are going everywhere. It's like Hogwarts. You know, you've got to zig and zag, and that's the next barrier that we're going to talk about. All right, we're going to go to an island called Ship Trap Island. It's the setting for a short story called The Most Dangerous Game. I'm going to tell you the whole story of The Most Dangerous Game in two slides. All right, so we have a guy named Rainsford. Uh, his ship crashes. He swims ashore on a deserted island. He meets a general called Zarov. Zarov says, The Most Dangerous Game, Hunting Humans. And buddy... You're part of the game. you got a five-minute head start. Go. So, what happens? Rainsford narrowly escapes. Bows and arrows, ten different traps, dogs, gunfire, saves the world, <coughs> quicksand, almost drowns to death. Eventually, he realizes, I need to stop zigzagging, and I need to face this head-on. And so he does, and he defeats General Zara. Zigzagging is about avoiding, and perfectionists hate conflict. They hate it, so they avoid it. They zig, they zag. They delay any potential confrontation for as long as they can, and they agonize over it. They duck, they dodge, they deprioritize. Now, it's not procrastination. The way they duck and dodge and deprioritize is they do other work. But it's work that you're not involved in, because they're zigging and zagging. Now, psychologists also call this very similar to the Jonah complex. We run away from the responsibilities that we are fated to do. You can't zig, you can't zag, because the whale will catch up to you. And the whale is the IRS. Yeah, it could be. <laughs> so the perfectionist will postpone a meeting until next week. They will clean their desk again and again and again. And then they'll do some more work, again and again and again. But none of it involves you. They're waiting for that perfect moment. They're planning, but they zig and they zag. They zig, they zag. And the problem is, and this is according to Maslow, the Jonah complex, is they actually idealize these high moments when they're going to step in and save the day. But then they zig and they zag. Because even though they possess godlike abilities in those imaginary peak moments, we also shiver in fear at it actually coming. Now, knowledge is in the end based on acknowledgement, so what you need to do is acknowledge the fear. So that's the antidote, name the fear. Why am I afraid? Why am I zigging and zagging? Is it fear of the unknown, fear of change, fear of failure? By announcing that fear, you diffuse it. If you share it with somebody, guess what? You've just made yourself vulnerable, and you've just made a connection, and you've probably got the help you need. 
Now, in the Army, they say, after you name your fear, then you take action. They say, shoot, shoot move, communicate. Right? Name your fear. Shoot. Move. Communicate. Take action. In the most dangerous game, Rainsford continually acknowledged the situation. He zigged. He zagged. Finally, when he named his fear, he said, stop. I need to go ahead and take care of this. Now, fear has two meanings. Right? One of them, the negative one, is forget everything and run. The other one, though, is face everything and rise. It's really a choice. When you find somebody is like a watermelon seed and you try to nail them down and they <coughs> pop and they zig and they zag and they zig and they zag, ask them what they're afraid of. Right? Pretty simple, but it's a choice. And hopefully they can make that connection with you. All right. We're about to finish up. I know it's long. Any guesses here? 50 points. Squint hard. Oh, it's the Venus. You are so good. That is the birth of Venus. We chose this. Venus is an earthly goddess that inspires the physical world. She's also a heavenly goddess that inspires uh, the heavenly world. So we're going to talk about the pit and the pendulum. All right, so I'm going to go over this briefly, um, but we can think of ourselves in life as kind of swinging along a pendulum. And on either side of this pendulum are different zones. In the middle, let's call this the safe zone. These are where we're used to swinging back and forth, right? It's considered the safe zone because we can predict with some accuracy what we risk and what we're going to get out of it. Does that make sense? All right, occasionally we'll take risks, and I know this is really hard, and the bigger the corporation, the harder this is to do, because they don't look favorably on things that don't turn out well, <clears throat> right? So we'll go to the creativity zone. The risk and reward is less certain, right? If it works out, awesome, promotion. If not, ooh, that costs the company. Right? Very rarely will individuals go to the extreme risk zone, which on the opposite side also has what? The innovation zone. This is where you do groundbreaking work that changes things. But very few people want to go outside of the safe zone to go to consequences than it is to stare at the mind for the rest of your life. Ladies and gentlemen, we are back to Robin Island. Only this time, it's the 11th of February, 1990. And Robin Island is now a museum, right? Mandela has been freed. He's now the president. And at this particular time in Cape Town, <coughs> South Africa, the Rugby World's Cup is happening. And miracle of miracles... The South African rugby team is in the finals. They shouldn't be there. Grossly, gross, gross, gross underdogs. They never should be there. So Mandela takes them to Robben Island. They visit the cell that he was in. He gives them his insights. He talks about shame and dignity. He talks about Invictus. I am the master of my faith. I am the captain of my soul. But then a funny thing happens. He tells them another story. And it's equally important. He tells them about the particular <coughs> speech from Teddy Roosevelt. It's not the critic who counts. It's the man who actually gets into the arena. He has blood, sweat, and tears. He may come up short again and again, but he's spending himself in a worthy cause. At best, he might fail. Or at worst, he might fail. At best, he ends in triumph and high achievement. At worst, though, he fails while daring greatly. What we want to leave you with tonight is that it's not enough to be the master of your faith, the captain of your soul. We need to dare greatly. They won the championship. They actually defeated the team that they shouldn't have. Guess what? They weren't the perfect team, but they were masters of their faith, the captain of their souls, and they dare Thank you. Not too bad. So, Thank you.
for sticking in. Yes, obviously this is going to be about a three hour workshop. So Brian and I tried to condense it. We understand this is a huge amount of information. This was not supposed to be an hour lecture, but we crammed a lot at you, so we get that. Um, are there any other critiques that you guys feel comfortable enough that you would say, hey, these are things I would adjust uh, for the workshop? Yeah. Um, a common thing that you keep uh, going over is how uh, sort of the base of, of James is here. Mm -hmm. and here's as the core, right? Yep. Uh, but your graphic shows um, shame as being the heart, which would be generally the core. Right. So I think that might be a little backwards. I think we, we fear would, that. would be yeah. the heart. Shame is actually at the core. Okay. Right? Shame is wrapped around fear. The fear could be fear of the unknown, fear of control, fear of whatever. Shame is shame. Shame means I'm defective. Right? And that's, again, we did debate that. So, so, good point. We, st we may have stressed it the wrong way. Thanks. Good. Go ahead. Adrian, go. Uh, so, I was just wondering. Um, so, <coughs> first you said, don't be afraid of the German, <coughs> the, the example you gave, he was, like you said, zigzagging. But isn't it that, and then this might be just be misunderstanding something, but isn't it because he's exactly got the wrong? What's the difference? I don't know exactly. I might be misunderstanding the point of it, but what's the difference? It feels like his exactly was part of the journey that he needed to take to be able to go directly from the root of the problem. Yeah, yeah. So, so I'll answer that yeah. as succinctly as I can. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 I have personally zigzagged in my life, right? And sometimes good things happen when I zigzag. Great, right? But I was zigzagging. Does that make sense? You have to recognize the barrier for what it is and then get back on track. And ultimately what I've discovered, whether it's procrastination or zigzagging or numbing, what ultimately happens for most of us? So I'll answer it another way. Go ahead. So, um, yes, he's zigzagging. Yes, it's a tactic. It's a perfectionist tactic to avoid actually doing the right work that you're supposed to. Again, a perfectionist sees things as a straight line, right? The adaptives, when they're working on something, it may seem like they're zigzagging. There's ups and downs, and they spiral, but they're on that journey to try to to try to do something. They're not necessarily zigzagging. The intention of zigzagging is avoidance. Right? That's definitely the tactic that Rainsford was doing. And yeah, we're just doing know, that as an example. But uh, the intention, though, is to avoid something. I was using tacking. Like a sailing? <coughs> oh, tacking. Tacking, yeah. So I just said tacking. Catching the wind at different points. Yeah. That would be a different. Yeah. That would be a different. Bennett. Uh, early on, you were talking about the Da Vinci and the maladaptive perfectionist. And when you get that, I didn't really. Understand, or maybe I didn't hear enough, or you have more in your explain of why Picasso was an adaptive perfectionist because I didn't know he was a perfectionist. Oh, oh God. Go. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and, and it's, it's been a while, but um, do you remember? Um, uh, yeah, right. Uh, Picasso said there's no such thing as a bad Picasso. Right, uh, Picasso's uh, solution to egotism was more egotism. <laughs> so, and, and, it, and, and egotism is part of the perfectionist thing. He, and, and Picasso was not a happy man. I mean, most of his life he spent in isolation. Right, he was incredibly per, per, productive. So when we say Picasso was adaptive, I think personally Picasso did some pieces that he didn't like very much that were experiments, but he was such a master salesman that he basically said, I've never done a bad Picasso. And that was his sales. He managed his perfectionism. Right. I have office hours. I'm going to work this time. You leave me alone. You leave me alone. I'm only going to have dinner with these for this group of artists. Because I get something out of it. So the word adaptive really means manage. Right. Yeah, you could say that he just manages extreme management. So I would offer you to explain that because I was kind of lost on that. 
Okay. Yeah, we can do that. Uh, the actual good. terms are adaptive and maladaptive, is what the psychologists say. They don't say managed and non managed. Um, the other perfectionists, they manage it, but in a negative way. Uh, they don't really understand that the behavior is wrong. It's just that's the way you react to this type of situation. They try to manage the situation, right? But it's usually by diffusing it or distancing and disconnecting. I still think you can be unhealthy as an adaptive, but maladaptive is more unhealthy. So you're saying that perfectionism isn't necessarily curable, you can only manage it. Is that what you're saying? Sure. Sure. <laughs> sure. Yeah. I don't know. I'm not cured. <laughs> Great, so they so the question is why is it a problem if the first shoe dropped? So the people are leaving uh, famine, war, religious persecution, they're actually really happy. The other shoe drops in the middle of the night, they wake up, they can't go back to sleep. Oh my god, the other shoe's about to drop, something bad's about to happen. Oh my god, you dropped the shoe. Was it the Gestapo? Right? Was it somebody doing religious persecution? Was it that neighbor that I ran away from? Right? I'm happy. Oh my God, I just want to get some sleep. And so it's that noise, and they wait for that other thing, the other shoe to drop. They're happy, yet they can't enjoy it because the other shoe is not pleasant. Um, I don't know if this is useful, but sarcasm is I understand that sarcasm is a, a form of <coughs> anger. Right. Yeah. And anger is often related to uh, somebody expressing uh, power or trying to get power out of a bad situation and also uh, recognizing, uh, or they do it when, when their bike, when their rights have been violated. Somebody's taken over my territory. So right. Anyway, I just wanted to offer that. I don't know if it's useful or not. So you started talking about sarcasm, you can say anything about. What did I say, buddy? No, we didn't. We didn't address it as as an anger mechanism. I think we, you're right. We so talked about bullying a little bit. We said it was, a, it was hostility. Yeah. Right. So it is hostility. You're right. Right. And it could be the trigger is, oh my God, something is wrong. Whatever. Well, it's it's also interesting because perfectionism is also a big characteristic of narcissism. So um, I know this like the whole workshop like you guys are planning it's more like uh, looking at everybody as an individual so um, we all have to some degree we try to perfect everything in life and this is just a way to uh, produce more outcome uh, one of the things I suddenly noticed is that throughout the talk I was going through and noticing is that uh, we all deal with different type of people in uh, on our daily day-to-day -day basis so one of the quote you both had on that, um, and you were talking about it, uh, Jay, was uh, when you look at uh, the person, like, you know, what their intent is, or uh, when you understand that you you, you don't, um, you know, associate the person's behavior with the person itself, like, uh, for example, like, you know, James here, you know, like, great guy, but he could be like, no, no, you, I love blue color, I hate your team, and if I associate that with James, you know, I'm just, just yeah. you know, putting an example, so they two are not related, that's just his opinion uh, and him. Yeah. So what I would say is um, respect the individual, yeah. but not the action, right? And so really, the we're trying to give you coping strategies yeah. for the actions. So my point was, this workshop is actually um, could be in a, a spun into like a dealing with people too. Like I mean, this was this was great. Like in the in the side background and the side movie kind of thing, it, it's it's giving a lot of feedback on dealing with people. Brian and I have both heard from. All the workshops that we've done, I think almost every workshop that we've done together, we hear people having frustration. Mm -hmm. Either a business guy with an artist, mm -hmm. right? Or somebody's in a corporation and nobody's listening to them, mm -hmm. right? When they have good information, mm -hmm. right? And we, we can probably recognize a lot of these barriers in our everyday life. Mm -hmm. And if we are reactive, Yes. We buy in and let that energy infect us. But if we recognize it for what it is, we're better suited to deal with it and not let it affect us. Yes. 
Does that make sense? So I'm going to say something that's going to sound sarcastic, but I really mean it. When somebody says they do perfect, uh, pixel perfect design, in my head I say, so what? Okay? Seriously, so what? You do pixel perfect design on what? So what? What is it you're trying to solve? What problem are you trying to solve? Seriously, are you actually solving something? You can do pixel perfect garbage. <laughs> it doesn't solve anything. And then if you're not solving something, what you're producing, what you're giving to the world is pixel perfect uselessness. Right? You know, we see all of this stuff about everything's got to be pixel perfect and bulletproof and all of this. And really it's not about problem solving. When people look at the resumes that come in, they don't want to see the pixel perfect stuff. They want to see what was your thought process behind solving this problem. Right? When you try to go and uh, place someone, you probably want to see the thought process, you want to see some websites, what was the problem, what did you do, what was the before, what was the after. Right? That thought process. Okay? We always start with the end point, and we don't really think through the journey sometimes. The well, actions. Well, you can decide what your thought process is. Back to Ellis Island, he, he was great uh, sort of build up of immigrants coming to this promising new land, everything's going awesome. But the pictures, everyone looks so miserable. Like, <laughs> <laughs> they actually weren't. I think that from the documentary. Yeah. That was uh, from a family that was happy to be here. They're very successful and have started businesses. They weren't miserable. It's yeah, I mean, you should have seen. Yeah. I, they look kind of miserable. I, I, I think what I think what's missing, and and this is interesting. I grew up overseas in Germany, right? And Germany is probably one of the most westernized European countries in the eighties, seventies, eighties when I grew up there, anyways. And I got an opportunity to go to East Germany before the wall came down. And when I went to East Germany as kids, we got to go into a store. And on the outside of the stores, you see all these products, which we're used to seeing in Western civilization all the time. If you go down the street or at Dallas, whatever, you see all the beautiful stuff in the window. You go in the store and realize that's all they have. Everything they have is in the window. You go in the store and there's nothing there. From As Americans, we are so used to seeing that it's hard in that, when you see that, to realize that's a step up for them. Well, what I'm just saying is that, I mean, they're not smiling or anything, just it's just on a purely, like, visual. Right. Yeah, back, back, is, back in the, uh, back, a lot of people didn't smile in photos. Look at your book picture. <laughs> look at your book, seriously, look up on YouTube, look up your book pictures from, like, 19, yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't like 20, socially acceptable, 30s, 40. But it's a you can maybe, like, do a contrast of how much work it was. Yeah, maybe yeah, show how bad it was somewhere else. Here's the bad. This is the good. Actually, oh, that's good point. Yeah, it was uh, the O'Donnell family. They were escaping a famine in Ireland. Famine. And uh, they actually didn't eat like, when they were in Ireland, they ate like every two or three days. They were starving. So you might have got them on a day they weren't eating. Damn. Uh, <laughs> Any other questions or comments? Justin. Smash and grabs uh, interesting because you can do a smash and grab publicly in front of a person. You can do it privately or you can do it online. I mean, they're awful. It's just an awful, awful behavior. Because what you're using is you're using people sharing something that's intimate or personal to them and you're using it against them. <clears throat> and I think that's not. Adam, sorry to use your picture. It was on Facebook. Yeah, I did a special grab. My first recommendation is to do the 
<laughs> That's my favorite slide. I told you there was a picture though, so it's not really a sketch. Of but after the presentation, I said I'll just a couple of little technical things. I'm sure, probably buy yourself some time back, uh, particularly when you got more when you go off here and you get your word, some of the word your slides, and you can read a little bit less of it. But you did you did a great job this time. Try to find some error where you can for some of those reading like people are going to So I'm going to pass it to you. You did a great job getting your main point. Josh, I think one section, going along with that one section, I think that could be used as a concern as well. Uh, there was a part near the beginning where you were comparing and contrasting the adaptive and the maladaptive. Yeah. And I felt like that section may have gone on a bit too, too, too long. Too many slides. You, yeah. you got my point after slide yeah, four. Yeah, I think so. I think um, maybe. Saying that and buying a couple of them. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Sounds good. Good feedback. Yeah. And I want to really note that that point, that's the part of the presentation that I just kind of, no, I don't get the conditions now adapted. You know, and, and then your evidence for that as well. Costs are so terrific, blah, blah, blah. And he only created two messages. And he's like, yes, but his body of work was enormous. You know, and his contribution to society was enormous. So I have a hard time with thinking of the lynching as an hour that. Really? So seriously, okay, hold on. Are you talking about personality talks? I don't nonetheless they've got okay, for so, okay, okay, hold on, hold on. Time out. Time out. Okay. Thirteen thousand pages of sketches, right? That is his contribution to society other than Mona Lisa and No, and, and the Indians and the Earth. I mean that actually got produced. Hold on, hold on. That's actually no, right, right, right. Hold on. He never wanted those shared. He hoarded that and hid that. He never wanted that shared. Yeah. That's but the most maladaptive thing you can do. And they were I mean, he wasn't joyful in like he wasted yeah. my hours. So he, he said he did his work. He, like he didn't mean to share that. He didn't mean to share that. So so here's something interesting about Da Vinci and Picasso, at least from my perspective. <coughs> One of the things, whether you like Picasso or not, he was kind of an ass. I mean, he was he was a philanderer and all this other good stuff. Sorry. All right. Yeah. Yeah. So, but however, when they have the meme of poor artist, he worked it. He made money on his art in his lifetime. He didn't die, and then his stuff was worth something in his lifetime. He actually. In Da Vinci's lifetime, he was beaten up and manipulated, right, and really abused his entire life. If you look at his his, if you look at his life, he had a very miserable life. Da Vinci did, and he had lots of ideas, but what did he do with them? Last up, right? Took him three years to paint. He couldn't finish the face of Jesus or Judas. He couldn't find. Your evil or perfection to take it years. Three years. Perfection. He did a fresco style that was messed up. Other artists have to try and save it. Right? And he is, he got now lots of all over. He was point A to point B. It's all about the destination. And what was his strategy when he got pushed to finish the painting? Pretty passive aggressive. He told the priest, sure, I'll use your face for the face of Judas. I just saw there's this fine line between you kind of cross over and go through both processes. There is. There the dark is. gives you resilience to the light, and the light gives you resilience to go back to the dark. It's a scale. Yeah, that's something that you maybe want to point out at some point in here is that this is not a binary thing, right. and that you're not all one or all. There's have great. someone yes, that yes, is yes. adapted in some ways, maladaptive in others. You can see that yeah, sometimes you have a bad day and you cross over to maladaptive. So. I don't so think this is a solution to one of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. 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 I hope I kind of uh, dealt with that when I shared a little bit of my own stuff. And I'm a recovering perfectionist. Does that make sense? I consider myself very maladaptive in my 20s. 
I threw away every single drawing I did until I was 25. It was never good. Yeah. 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 started studying UX, and Brian told me this, was Sturgeon's Law. And Sturgeon Law says 99% of everything is crap. And if you look on YouTube, right, that kind of holds true. Now, my, I have some friends, Brian and I both have friends, uh, Stefan Marnay, who's one of the top concept designers in the world, um, and some other Disney artists that we know. And all of them say it is about producing a large amount of stuff to get the one or two gems that work, right? So photographers <clears throat> take a thousand pictures and pick two, and that's what they put on the website. Perfectionism prevents you from doing a thousand things. The maladaptive perfectionist doesn't do a thousand things, and because of that, what they're able to produce is extremely No, they'll have a thousand sketches. Yeah. Yeah. A thousand starts. A thousand starts and not finish. Yeah. For the movie industry. And Picasso was a finisher. In our talk, we said finishing is better than starting. And the main point, if you're a designer, if you let your perfectionism Get in the way of finishing your book, your movie, your whatever, your app. 
your thing that you've been talking about for 10 years that you haven't started, that's a problem. That's what our workshop hopes to do, is trigger you that maybe you're on your, you're your own worst enemy. Well, that's what actually just said. In the workshop, are we going to have some <coughs> We're going to have exercises. Yeah, it'll be exercises. Yeah. Yeah, sit up. Yeah, yeah we're going to have exercises. Yeah, there'll be exercises. Yeah, there'll be exercises. Yeah. All right, that's it. That's a wrap. Thank you guys so much for coming. Meetups, they're actually out on the Meetup app. Um, oh, and if you happen to have $20 and you want a signed book, right, this first edition signed book, Ben and I will, uh, you know, personally sign it for you. Our signature is already in here, but I'll sign a note for you if you want. All right, but Ben handles the money. If you don't have the money, it's available on Amazon. When I win an Oscar, it means whatever. In the future, this will be worth something. Don't want this that. Anyway, thank no, you guys.